Hi, um, I'm Robin Osborne, and I too am very happy to be here. And I, I'm especially grateful to PLA and to the California Library Association, their literacy section, for putting this together. This is an incredible event. Um, I'm calling my, my, my address Libraries Enhanced Literacy, and I, I got that phrase from, from Dr. Wedgworth several years ago at, at a program, an ALA pre-conference, where he was asked to speak, and he said, the mission and goals of all libraries is to enhance literacy, that libraries exist to enhance every individual's ability to read and write and speak English or other languages, compute and solve problems, and I, I thank him for that because it's a nice turn of phrase, and it's something I think we can all use, libraries enhance literacies. I work in New York State um, for a library system, so I work with, with a lot of independent libraries to develop services. Library de development in New York State does not fund literacy. Not. This year, we have a two-year um, competitive grant of, of, for $200,000 for 740 libraries in the state to get some funds to do something with literacy. So, so as, I, as far as I'm concerned, it's not much. But you work with what you've got, and, and so we've been able to use those types of, of RFPs and LSTA RFPs to fund small projects that ultimately a lot of people can use to support and enhance literacy in their libraries, and I wanted to, to talk about a couple of those. Um, I work in the outreach department at, at our library, so a lot of what I do is about c conversing with people and making partnerships with people in the community to identify needs and, and issues that need to be addressed. And some time ago, our, our first, um, since I've been there, projects have been working with, with the new immigrants in the community, and, and just as everywhere in the country, it's a soaring population. In, in 2000, there was a statistic given that, that Westchester County, where I work, it was in the top 5% of counties in the U.S. that attracted new immigrants. So lots and lots and lots of people. So as we were working with people um, serving the community, we were trying to identify issues that, that, information issues that would help these folks come into the community. And one of the first things we developed was a resource directory, a bilingual resource directory written in plain language. Actually, the second one was in plain language. The first one was written by a social service agency that nobody understood but them. <laughs> so, so we learned, we learned. But, but this is now an, a, a, a directory that we have online in English and in Spanish that is updated frequently, that gives you access to more than 180 organizations in the county that serve, that provide different types of services for immigrants and for, for everybody. It's not just, it's for everybody. There's health services, there, there's legal services, there, there's um, a lot of youth services that people need to know about. So these are resources that we can develop that everybody can use. Another issue that came up right away was, was under, helping folks understand how the school systems worked because um, it seemed that a number of the school districts were kind of uh, misinforming and ultimately uh, disserving new immigrants in terms of, of enrolling their kids for schools and, and, and what services were available to them. So what we did is we contracted with a, a student advocacy organization to write a simple question and answer document on how public schools work in New York State, English and Spanish. This, this is, what you're seeing is, is the Spanish version, but in, in the, um, on, on another uh, site I'll show you soon, it will be a way to get to it in English, and there's a, there will be a website up with, with direct access to this document. But th this is an amazing piece of work. It, we printed, we've printed thus far, it's in its second edition, we've printed about 20,000 copies, they're gone. And what we do with them is we take them out. We take them out to Head Start programs, we go to PTAs, we go to parent association meetings, and we say this is the document, this is what it has, this is how it works, here's some phone numbers, let's talk about how you can help your kids in school. It's that human touch. A document is one thing, but a person is the, is the connector. We connect people with information. 
So this, this has been incredibly valuable as we've gone on. In our next iteration of project, we, we were lucky enough to be um, one of the pilot projects for the National, for the National Department of Education funding of the English language, English literacy civics education projects that are now funded throughout the states and, and, and are available on state level. We were funded nationally to partner with an organization because we thought, well, we're, we're best to learn civics, but at the public library. From that, our job in, in, in that partnership was to develop resources, either bibliographies or in, in, in what we'd hoped to do was also develop websites that would help folks who were learning how to live here learn the skills and, and have reference points to things about education, about health care, legal issues, getting a job, all these things that everybody wants to know. So from this project evolved an online library for low-level readers called firstfind.info. Um, you have a bookmark in your packet and, and in the bibliography that's also included in your packet is a link to a, a booklet that ALA published about the development of First Find, including the criteria that we use to include sites, um, how it evolved, how we got from A to B to C, and it's still there. First Find is still, still with us and everybody can use First Find. That's, that's the beauty of the web. Currently, there are more than 350, no, no, I'm sorry, that's, that's wrong, 800 sites. There's 300 sites in the health section that connect people to websites um, written in plain language, usually fifth, sixth grade level. We, again, that's the criteria that we use that help people link to, to um, information that they need. There's also a way to, to link to local information. We had a partnership recently with the Williamsport, Pennsylvania Public Library, and they fed us, uh-oh, stop. <laughs> it's, it's, it's doing its own thing. Stop it. Okay. Anyways, they, they fed us information that, that linked to local health care agencies in their area. So while you were looking for information about diabetes and you wanted to say, well, I, I want to go find the clinic in my neighborhood. Click, click, click. Here it is. This is a, a, a service that we can make available to everybody in this room. I mean, and I think this is, this is a, an issue for all of us to discuss and think about as we move forward is how do we share you don't need to, re to, to do First Find. We did First Find. But how do we grow First Find? How do we grow the library? How do we grow information in your community that will help people on that, that local level? So that, that, there's a challenge for you. Anyways, so this is how First Find, the health section, like I said, has 350 sites. We've indexed it. And then we use it. How do we use it? And this, this has been a real interesting thing for us. We have a lot of connections with adult ed programs. The Literacy Assistance Program in New York City uses this widely. I think they're the, the, the biggest user. But there's other people as well. One of the things that, that came to us through other outreach services that we do, we work with the prisons and we work with transitions. And, and one of the things that people need as, as they're leaving is, is help in finding a job and how to find a job, creating a strategy to find a job. So we contracted with some money from somewhere that we always seem to find when needed to develop a how to find a job manual written in plain language. And, and she did so. And it was reviewed by people who work in, in adult literacy. And it's on first find. So here it is, how to find a job. Congratulations, you are ready to begin a job search. It's got 12 parts. It has a really smart way to think about um, filling out job applications and there's those trick questions about have you ever been convicted for a felony. Well, there's, there's, there's interesting conversation about that. There's also a data sheet that she created to help people, okay, this is, this is, this is being itself. <laughs> Stop it. Um, a data sheet to help people gather the information they need in order to fill out that job application or, and to have that interview. And there it is online. You can print it out. 
we've, we're printing it out now because we, we've got a program in, in Yonkers right now for ex-offenders where they can drop in and meet with this, the same person who wrote this and work out their job search strategy to, to help fill out an application online because that's what people do now. And a lot of the, especially when you're locked up, you don't know anything about computers. So it, it's, it's a way to make it live. Here it is. You can take it in your community and you can, you can bring it to life. I am way. We have another project that we developed. Um, and this is an online library in Spanish. It is enormous. There are probably 2,500 or 3,000 <coughs> links on this site. It is enormous. And of course, again, not everybody has to make this. Why, how do we need to find these ways to share these resources? But there are millions of, inf uh, of links to learning English. There's a section that hooks people up with their home country, which was really popular. Every country, here's a, here's a newspaper in Mexico. Click, 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 click in your home. Very popular and very important. How do we use it? it we were hooked up with a family, with an Even Start program. And, and the parents come regularly to the library to learn about finding and using health information via this, this online library. So we take them through the same steps. Here's how to get to the health section. Here's how to get to children's health. And here are ideas on nutrition. They learn how to evaluate what's a good website, what's not a good website. And this has been going for, and, and also links to these great tutorials if you don't know about them, but Medline, I'm sorry, Medline, uh, the uh, National Institute for Health Library has 165 online tutorials in English and in Spanish about a, a range of health issues. They're also available audio, so you don't even have to be a reader. It's, it's a great program, and, and we've linked to all of them. When I talk to the people who supervise the program, we notice changed outcomes in their behaviors. They, they've, they've changed their diets. They, we had a whole section on, on dental health that, that was, was like revolutionary to folks. And, and, and they think now about giving ba their babies juice in bottles, which wrecks their teeth. I didn't know that. Now I know. But anyway, all of these things, they're, they're very comfortable with computers. They go into the library now on their own and click, 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 click. There they are. They talk to one another. They talk to members of their family. It, it's created this whole network of, of information exchange so that now what we're doing is, is working on developing bookmarks of recommended sites around specific topics that these, these moms are making and we can distribute. It, it's been a, a great and excellent project in that way. So those, those are some of the projects that we've developed using grant money. And I, I, now I wanted to take a couple of minutes, and I have oh, good, a couple of minutes, to kind of do some, some philosophy stuff. In, uh, in the bibliography that, that's attached is, is a, a reference to an article by Susan Newman and Donna Solano called The Knowledge Gap. And in that article, they talk about a research project that they did studying different branches at, at the Free Library of Philadelphia where they installed, they, the, the, the Free Library got a, a bunch of money to, to install quality technology in every library in, in the system. And they were, they were really focusing on equalizing the access points and, and, and the delivery mechanisms to, across the board, across economic and, and, and cultural settings. And they did that, and what Donna and, and Susan did was go in and study to see how these services and how this technology did or did not level the, the playing field, for, for especially for children in, in, in the libraries. And the results indicated that the, despite heavy, heavy library uses, uh, usage across middle and low income children, there were quality differentials in the way the resources were used at all age levels prior to, after, and even stronger following a year after the, the technology renovations. 
What these studies suggest is that equal resources to economically unequal groups did not level the playing field, but rather widened the knowledge gap between low and middle income kids. I and mean, I think for us, <coughs> excuse me, in, in, in library land and as, as, as tech dependent and tech however we want to call it, we are, this is crucial for us to understand, is that it, it, the technology lives by itself, but it's only with the interaction with staff and specific programs that that technology will in fact be useful for everyone. Um, Donna and, and Susan closed their article with, with a description of, this, of, of a live librarian who would actually go and work with these kids and help them understand and navigate and benefit from these tech resources. And it was only because of this librarian that anything would happen. Mediation and engagement, that's the key. And I think that's, that's important for all of us to know. I, I show this slide. Um, this is a project that we did last summer where we, um, I worked with a, a journalist, Jill Nelson, to, to work with a bunch of kids to, who would go and interview their peers on their reading habits and preferences. We are, we are, all, are, we are all alarmed at, at the crisis in reading and the crisis in school and the crisis in school achievement gaps that, that face all of us. And what we were trying to do is kind of get, get the data from, from the kids on what was up and in and, and, and terms of what, they're, what they were about as readers and did they identify as readers. And mostly they didn't. Initially they didn't. When, when the kids went out with their little tape recorders and they said, do you read? No, I don't read. I don't like to read. I don't like to read. And they, they developed the skills to tease out that information. What was that about? Well, it was about school. And it was about the, 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 the enormous pressures and, and, and sense of failure that these kids were getting in their day-to-day -day life in school. They do read. You know, once we started teasing it out, they read, they read the magazines, they read the websites, they read newspapers, the sports scores, whatever, they read. But they don't identify as readers. And it seems to me that, that in, especially in public library settings, there's an opportunity for us to step in and say, we're not teachers, we don't have report cards, I'm not gonna test you, what do you wanna know? What do you want to learn? Because I'm here to help you. And I think that, that it's, it's just an opportunity for us to do this. In, in the bibliography, I also cited a, a citation to Vanessa Morris's fabulous article about um, using street, teen, sorry, street Lit in a teen discussion book group. I don't know if you're familiar with Street Lit or Urban Lit, but there's a whole genre of, of publishing now, mostly self-publishing and small press, of mostly African American, mostly urban settings talking about life life in, in, in the city. It's enormously popular. I mean, I don't know, you, you, you could do um, search checks on, on your collection and find that either they're, they're always out or they're lost or missing or gone because they are so popular. And, and a lot of libraries don't like to collect that and that's a different conversation. But the kids like to read it. And if the kids like to read it, then I think we should have it. And what Vanessa and her crew did, again in Philadelphia, was develop book discussion groups that use these books to talk about life, to talk about humanities. Humanities is the same issues. But they embraced what they read, when they read it, how they read it. They changed their whole CERC policies to embrace this readership and they created a whole new set of library users. This is something I think we should all listen to as a way that libraries can and should enhance literacy for all user groups of all ages and do what we do best. Thank you very much.